This episode was brought to you by ReadyMag. ReadyMag is a design tool for creating outstanding websites without coding, from quick landing pages to complex editorials. With advanced animations, more than 5,000 free fonts, plus teamwork and analytics, ReadyMag empowers both independent creatives and companies to meet their goals for online representation. For more information, visit ReadyMag.com, where you'll find inspiring examples of web projects made by ReadyMag users. We paid everyone very small amounts of money, but we did pay people. But, you know, it really was just asking for favor. Like, it was gigantic favors that all of our contributors were offering. And it really was like all of our friends. And, you know, that's how it started. And, you know, luckily, our first issue of a thousand copies sold out. So we had enough funding to do another small reprint of that. And then that sold out. And then we're like, oh, okay, maybe we can keep this going. We had no business plan. It was terrible. This is Print is Dead, Long Live Print, a podcast about magazines and the people who made and make them. I'm Deborah Bishop. I'm Patrick Mitchell. Michelle Outland has spent her career at some really beautiful magazines. Beautiful because she made them that way. Her resume includes stops at Martha Stewart's Everyday Food, Domino, Nylon, and Bon Appetit, as well as the magazine she created and launched with her good friend, Fiorella Valdesolo, Gather Journal. Gather which only published 13 issues, made a powerful impact on the magazine business. In its five-year run, it won a James Beard Award for Visual Storytelling, an Art Directors Club Award, and 20 medals from the Society of Publication Designers, including being named Brand of the Year in 2015. Under her leadership, Bon Appetit won the ASME National Magazine Award for Design, along with a slew of SPD awards. We talked to Michelle about the power of internships, about her Korean mother's influence on the way she thinks about food, about how to start a magazine in a post-print world and when we can expect the return of Gather Journal, about the strong female role models who shaped her career, and of course, we talked about pizza. So as we'll hear in the interview with Michelle, an internship changed her life. Her first internship was in high school for a design studio in Colorado where she grew up. And as it turns out, all of her internships were working for design studios that were primarily run by women. So I was thinking, have you had an internship, Deb? I never had an internship because where I grew up and was going to college for the first four years was in Calgary, Canada, and uh, they didn't really do that kind of thing. And there weren't that many design studios. But I was really lucky when I moved to New York in that I was hired by Paula Scher out of her class. She was my instructor. You moved to New York to go to school at SVA? That's right. And Paula Scher was my instructor. And so it was like an internship because um, I was hired mid-year and continued to work for her for four years or so. So (laughs) you weren't even looking for work. You're sitting there in school like every other student, and suddenly you find yourself working for one of the who would become, but who was even at the time, one of the most influential female designers in the world. What was that like? I mean, really exciting. If you can imagine a little girl from Port Neuf, Quebec, which is a tiny little town in Quebec, to all the way to Western Canada and then all the way to New York and getting that job, it was just unbelievable. And I, I talk a little bit about what you learned from her. You know, she she showed me that, you know, in those days it was still a male dominated business, pretty much. Um, but she showed me that women can be powerful and run their own business. And she taught me so much about good design and the importance and the history of graphic design, but mostly about the importance of typography as a basis for good design, uh, no matter you're designing a poster or a magazine. And I really still to this day feel like if you're a good type designer, you can tackle any design job. But more than that, she, she made me laugh. She's really funny and she's very smart and witty. And I think those things show up in her work. And so I was very influenced by that. And I hope that in my work, you can see some of those things. She's a pioneer. I've been in meetings with her and she doesn't mess around. 
And I know that she's said this at a lot of talks that she's given where she says the best ideas happen in the first, I don't know, minute, 90 seconds. And I can only imagine as a woman at the time in the 70s and 80s, how difficult it must have been for her to be so decisive in a meeting and and not have to fight. But I think she's she's really paved the way for women in our profession, in any profession, with just the strength of her convictions. I agree. I agree. And uh, she is, you know, she has an aura. She's strong. And she's able to be powerful in a meeting for a tiny woman. And I, I can relate to that because I'm small and uh, it's very easy to respect her. I don't have a great intern story. I did do two internships, one which turned into my first job. But I wanted to just briefly talk about this one intern experience I had when I was the creative director of Nylon. And I was putting my team together and I brought in Andrea Fella to work with me. And when we needed a little more help, we reached out for an intern and we met this kid, Michael Pangilinan. Everybody knows him as Mickey. He was still in school at the time, but he was such a superstar that we hired him and we said, Mickey, we'll just work around your schedule. And I don't know what happened with the rest of his school. I, th I, I believe he stayed in school, but he has gone on to make such an amazing career and uh, hopefully he'll be a future guest on the podcast. But I think the lesson is give internships, take internships. It could change your life. It changed Michelle Outland's life. So let's get to the interview. Let's do it. Let's talk about young Michelle. Where did sure. you grow up? Well, I was actually born in Lubbock, Texas. My father's side of the family is very much from the Texas, Oklahoma area. But when I was six months old, we moved to Colorado. And so Colorado is where I grew up until I was 18. But, you know, moving around Colorado here and there, but mainly Golden, Colorado is where I spent my formative years. I claim to fame as Coors Beer. And I loved growing up there. The mountains are beautiful, and all that sort of stuff. Very outdoor lifestyle. What did your parents do? Uh, my dad is an architect. So he was actually in Lubbock going to Texas Tech. So he studied architecture there. And uh, my mother's Korean. So they actually met in Korea when my father was an engineer in the army. But my whole life, as far as I can remember, my dad had his own architecture firm. Um, I think, you know, I was thinking back on it in terms of how it's influenced my career that I, I think both my parents are very entrepreneurial people. You know, my dad's had his own architecture firm my whole life. He's retired now, but um, the firm is still in existence. So I think both of them have been great role models for me in terms of Having somewhat of an entrepreneurial spirit, but also a hardworking ethos. And my mom also, you know, she's done a variety of things, started her own fashion clothing business that produced silk garments out of Korea. And then she's also run just different other businesses as well. So they've they've always been very enterprising and entrepreneurial, which I think has been a, a big influence on me. As we'll find out soon, so are you. <laughs> Growing up, what was your first memory of design? When did you start thinking it was something you might want to pursue? I mean, I, I've i always been into the arts since a very young age. And, um, you know, art class was always my favorite in school, <laughs> favorite class in school. And I think my parents definitely recognized that. And so they very kindly invested in me going to art camps during the summertime. And that was hugely influential to me. And then, you know, as I got older and knew that perhaps a career in the arts was something I really wanted to pursue. My dad, who is, uh, you know, he's in the business. And so he he was like, okay, let's really think about like what you like the arts, but like what, what part of the art are we talking about here? And, you know, that's where I was, I was in high school and I kind of didn't know. And he was like, well, look, I, I uh, my office space shares with a graphic designer. Why don't you go over and speak to her and learn about what she does a little bit? And so I went over and met this woman, Christina Weber, and I sort of um, credit her for my whole career. She um, wow. changed the course of my life and we're still in contact and she's just a wonderful person. Um, but she had a design studio in Denver and um, mostly specializing in print collateral and branding and she gave me my first internship when I was 16 and just like literally had no idea what graphic design was. <laughs> but I spent the whole summer there and I, it really sort of changed the course of my life. That's, uh, well, that's amazing. 
Were there magazines in the house when you were a kid? Yeah, there always were. Did any in particular uh, catch your eye? Well, my dad always had Architectural Digest around <laughs> being an architect, but Time Magazine was always in the house. I remember, obviously, my grandparents, I think a lot of people of that generation had National Geographic's around. Um, so I definitely remember those. And then as far as like the magazine that was hugely influential to me was when I went to start my internship at Weber Design. And it was my first day and I was kind of sitting in the back room just not knowing what to do. <laughs> and Chris brought over a book by Neville Brody. And she was like, I want you to just sit and look through this. And I was like, what is the face magazine? <laughs> and like, what? You can design typography? And that really just like shot me into a whole nother direction. And so I, I really became obsessed with the face and that whole genre just really took me in a whole nother you, you, direction. You were able to find copies of the face in Denver? At the time, no. <laughs> but um, <laughs> once I, I went to college, I definitely it became a regular purchase that I would splurge for. Yeah. Where did you go to college? Um, so then from there, I was very excited to be accepted to the Rhode Island School of Design. So that was my first time away from Colorado and did the big move to Providence, Rhode Island. And then I ultimately became a major in graphic design at RISD. At that time, I had interned for Chris for three summers. Like, And I was just very thankful that by the time I got to college, I knew what I wanted to do. And so I felt like hopefully I made my experience very valuable because I, I knew what to focus on very quickly. And when you were at RISD, did you do internships there too? Yeah. So again, I think I interned for Chris one more summer, maybe between my freshman, sophomore year in college. And then I think they were encouraging us to find internships while I was in college. And so I found this company in Boston called Moore Moskowitz Design. And I started interning for them while I was at um, like summertime in college. And that was a husband wife team, Jan Moskowitz and Tim Moore. And it was quite a small studio. Most of the time it was just them. And again, hugely influential in my career. Did you stay with them throughout your time at RISD? I did. Um, I interned for them for a couple summer, two or three again, and then was very excited when they hired me straight out of school. So after RISD, I went to work for them. But, you know, as is with the design business, you know, they were very small studios, just the two of them. And at that point, I actually think we were like working out of their house. So I would commute to Brookline and work in a room in their house and it was great. I loved it, but it wasn't at certain points sustainable for them. You know, business is hard. So they had to let me go at a certain point. And um, I started working with another design studio in Boston called Eimer Design, another husband, wife, Doug and Selena Eimer. And they were also so wonderful. And I, I learned a lot there, too. How did you get started in magazines? I think at that point, I'd been in Boston a couple of years and most of my friends from RISD had moved to New York City. And so I was sort of itching to move to New York. But also when I was working for Jan and Tim, Tim was British and he used to be an instructor in England. You know, they taught me a bit about British design and I was always like, ah, I want to go check out London. And they were like, oh, we have some family friends that you could go live with them and be a nanny for their kids. And I was like, okay. You know, I was in my 20s. And um, so I went to be an au pair. But right before I left, I came to New York and tried to have a bunch of interviews and just circuit, you know, dropped off my resume wherever I could. Nothing was sticking. So I was like, all right, let's just go to London. So I, I went to London and was an au pair for two wonderful kids and um, tried to get a little bit of design work and went clubbing and really enjoyed London. And <laughs> Did I see something about Central St. Martin's in your uh, resume? Yeah. And so like while I was there, I definitely learned about Royal College and Central St. Martins and just kind of tried to take in the design scene and ethos in England, which I think is incredible. I, I love the level of design there. Did you go to Neville Brody's house? <laughs> I didn't stalk him to that extent, but pretty close, actually. <laughs> I think I tracked down his studio. <laughs> But while I was there, somehow my resume had gotten passed on to Martha Stewart Living. And one of the art directors, James Dunlinson, he's British, he happened to be in London. He was visiting his family and got in touch with me and was like, oh, you know, I'm in London. Could you interview? And I was like, OK. And so I met him in London and we sat down for an interview. And I, I was also like, I 
never done magazines. I don't understand what you do. Could you tell me a little bit about it? James is an incredible art director. And so he was very gracious and, and explained a little bit about like how the process works there. And I was like, wow, that sounds really cool. And amazingly, they offered to hire me after that interview. And so that helped bring me back to the States. And I mean, I had to leave the country anyways. They were, <laughs> they didn't want me there anyway. <laughs> so, uh, so it was great. It was perfect timing. And that helped me move to New York. And that was my first job in magazines was at Martha Stewart Living. We'll be right back. Print is Dead is made possible with the support of Mag Culture. Read our online journal, listen to our podcast, and visit our shop to discover why we're convinced print is very much alive. All available at magculture.com. So in addition to the creative titles you've had, you've added founder. That's pretty special. Talk about how Gather Journal got started. So, you know, I had gone through a series of working at various magazines from Martha Stewart, various publications within that, to Domino Magazine, which is another big title from Condé Nast. And then I got an opportunity to work at Nylon Magazine as their art director. And it was the complete opposite world of both of those. Martha and the Condé title were pretty decent budgets, very corporate. And Nylon was this cool downtown magazine independent, but, you know, a decent publication rate. And it had always been a title that was influential to me as a designer. The editor-in-chief, Marvin Scott Jarrett, founded Ray Gunn. And, you know, obviously David Carson was his controversial art director, but hugely influential in the design world. And, and so I really wanted to have the opportunity to work with Marvin. So, you know, it was very different from the path that I was on in terms of this sort of bigger corporate path. And so I went took a huge pay cut and went to work at this downtown magazine. And it was a wild time, <laughs> really. You know, it was like every month you're like, that's a miracle that a magazine came out because it was a bunch of 20, 30 somethings who, and I, you know, I actually, I think Marvin has a really, and I've learned this from like a lot of people in my career, especially Martha as well is a great way to run a place is to surround yourself with really great people and let them do you know the best that they do and to a great extent you know that's how nylon was run as well we were like really left to do our jobs and it wasn't you know uh you need to be here at this time but it was just like make sure magazine goes to the press at the end of the month kind of thing and do whatever you have to do and then, you know, in between kind of thing. So, you know, it really was this new experience where I was, you know, it was an extremely small staff. I had been used to these staffs that had full art departments, full production departments, full photo departments. And, you know, suddenly I, it was an art department of me and one other designer and we had to interface with advertisers and get their files in and to explain to them how the file needed to be. And, you know, it was like a whole nother level of, you know, from beginning to end of designing a full magazine, color correcting it yourself. I mean, we did have a production house that ultimately, but, uh, you know, you had to mark up all the color and proof every single page, including ad pages and um, get a magazine out every month. And so I learned so much and I'm, it was wild and crazy but it was such a wonderful time and I learned a lot and after leaving that job which might show a consistent thread in my career is really at the end of it I burnt out and it was time to go so you know when I I left I took some time and quite honestly I was baking a lot of bread <laughs> and uh, uh this was you know way before the pandemic before everyone was baking bread <laughs> and uh while I was baking bread this food magazine came into my head. And um, I had met Fiorella at Nylon Magazine. She was the beauty editor at Nylon, also deputy editor as well. And we were great friends. And we all, you know, one big thread between our friendship is that uh, we love food. We both have immigrant parents. And I think food has been a really big part of holding on to our culture, learning about our culture, 
through our families. And then also we just eat out all the time and talk about food all the time. And so we had this common interest. But I think also beyond that, the fun thing about Nylon was that it was a fashion, beauty, culture magazine. And these were all topics that really greatly interested us. And so, you know, we were like, how do we take what we learned from Nylon and put that into another format? And so we kind of developed this idea of this food magazine that was a little unconventional and covered art and culture as well. But at the end of the day, I also brought a lot of what I learned at Martha and wanted people to really cook from it. And so that was why we set it up as a recipe style magazine, but with a lot of layers on it and, you know, visual layers, editorial layers, etc. How did you pay for it? Our own money. So we had some savings and we went in 50-50 and, you know, with the money that we had, which was very little, <laughs> uh, we printed 1,000 copies. That was our first issue. And we were like, oh, we hope our parents buy some copies, <laughs> you know, and then asking a lot of friends. Were your contributors working for free? We paid everyone very small amounts of money, but we did pay people. But, you know, it really was just asking for favors. Like, it was gigantic favors that all of our contributors were, were offering. And it really was, like, all of our friends. Like, we were, you know, I was asking all, all of my photographer friends. Fee was asking all of her writing friends. And, you know, that's how it started. And, you know, luckily... Our first issue of a thousand copies sold out. And so we had enough funding to do an, another small reprint of that. And then that sold out. And then we're like, oh, okay, maybe we can keep this going. We had no business plan. It was terrible. It was, <laughs> we, we really just, I think for both myself and Fiorella, I think we have this true love of art and creativity. And that was really why we started Gather. It was not to make money. And I also want to point out that <laughs> magazines will not make you rich. <laughs> How did you get it out in the world? Grassroots. I really like li I live on 12th Street and I walk down to Costa Magazines, which I, I love that they're getting a lot of press right now. But I've known them for all the years that I've lived in the West Village and was like, would you? maybe sell my magazine and they were our first stockists you know i literally walked it down to them and asked if they would sell it so it was very grassroots of us just like walking into stores and being like we have this thing can you maybe sell it <laughs> you were selling it internationally too weren't you yeah and so you know thankfully you want I mean, again, just so incredibly and so thankfully that the first issue was so well received and, and got quite a bit of press. And, you know, again, the power of press is pretty impressive that the word got out. And, and thankfully from there, we really didn't have to market the magazine. We were able to just everything was people getting in touch with us. For our listeners who maybe haven't seen it, it's really genuinely one of the most beautiful magazines ever. You. So it's a little bit on hiatus now, right? Yes. We published for six years and um, we produced 13 issues. So we did two issues a year. And at the tail end of it, things just in our lives started happening. Um, Fiorella had a child and motherhood. And I took on a, a rather large position at Bon Appetit. So it was just, uh, you know, for the way we sustained producing Gather was through freelance work. Gather was not our full-time job by any means. We shot issues of Gather on the weekends. And in the meantime, we freelanced. And so I have I have a, a big freelance career at, at working all over the city here. And I'm thankful for the city for that. And that's how we were able to sustain and produce Gather by, you know, having these freelance jobs and doing Gather as a real passion project. And then just when these other bigger life things happened, our passion <laughs> just got tired. And so uh, we just couldn't physically do it. It's a lot of extra work. Yeah, it's a lot. But again, every time an issue came back from the printer, it was just th so thrilling. So it's something we'd love to return to if we can. What's your favorite thing about magazine making and your least favorite? <laughs> it's funny because uh, I'm actually teaching a class this semester at Art Center. I'm teaching a food photography class at Art Center in Pasadena. So I'm working with all these young photographers, budding photographers, all very talented. And, it, you know, obviously it's sort of odd that I'm not a photographer teaching a photography class, but I think 
hopefully what I'm bringing to the class is showing them how our commercial world works. And the main thing that I'm trying to impress upon them is how collaborative our business is. And um, even from a photo shoot to a magazine, it's incredible how many people it takes to put it together. It is not a one man show <laughs> by any means. And so, you know, that's something that I'm really trying to impress upon on them and anyone else who's listening that I do think the a big part of this industry that I love is interacting with people and interacting and and working as a team to you know and especially for example the relationship between me and Fiorella I think she's a genius editor she's a genius editor she's a genius writer and when we came together to form Gather, I knew that she was the best at what she does. She knew I was best at what I do. And so we were like, you handle words, you handle visuals. And we really left it to each other. We very rarely would stray over and be like, oh, man. you know, but we would if we needed to. We absolutely could say it, but there was a lot of trust. There was mutual respect yeah, and yep. trust. And do you think that, you know, talk about your best relationships with editors and how is that? I mean, obviously that was a special relationship you yeah. had with her. Totally. I mean, I think, you know, for us people in the art department, <laughs> I think it really, uh, the memorable working relationships with editors typically comes from an editor who's really visually minded because, you know, our job is to translate the editorial content that is brought forth to us, if not collaboratively developed with them. And we then translate it into the visual. And we have to be able to articulate our feedback on their content. And it certainly helps when they can articulate feedback on our content as well. So it's sort of, you know, the more it can be sort of a two-way conversation, I think it, you know, that makes the memorable working relationships. And it makes, obviously, you know, the strongest content. That is ultimately all of our goals is to how do we take these worlds of written and visual and translate that into this one cohesive piece that's, you know, engaging and moving? For me, it really comes down to communication. We'll be right back. Print is Dead is made possible with the support of the Society of Publication Designers. The SPD powers the future of visual storytelling, setting the standard for editorial excellence and shaping the future of visual culture. For more information, visit spd.org. Pretty much you've been working on food and fashion. Yeah. What is it about those areas that attracted you? I love the visuals of food. I think oftentimes before we actually have that experience of taste, we have sight and smell. I love figuring out a transformative visual for food or a visual that helps explain what that food is about to taste like. So there's that visual. And then, you know, obviously, I think fashion is not too far from that in terms of, you know, something that excites the eye and can be very transformative to, to someone who wears it. But, you know, clearly very obsessed with the, the visual of food. And then I think, you know, certainly the direction that I took the gathers visual, because I had been certainly very well trained in the world of Martha. And I'm so, so thankful for all the training that I learned there, which was much more sort of a naturally lit type of food photography style, which I think she was hugely influential. Gail Towie especially helped drive that visual in terms of at the time when they the magazine was founded in 1990. And I think they were huge in, in that development of photography and um, learned a lot from it. And I'm so thankful for that. And then I think the time we founded Gather, I wanted to try and look at food in a slightly more cinematic sort of way, because I love the experience of being in a restaurant or at a dining table and how the lighting and the color of the room and this and that really sort of transforms mm -hmm. that that experience. And so trying to, you know, I think with the visuals of Gather, get more atmospheric and transportative. You've been involved in a lot of startups and redesigns, and you've created a look and feel for some pretty legendary brands, Martha Stewart, Everyday Food, Domino, and of course, Gather. How do you think about creating design systems for big brands and starting them from scratch? I clearly enjoy it. And I've been, you know, so honored to be brought in on those initial teams. 
I think it goes back to that entrepreneurial spirit from my family that uh, I just love getting in on the the get go. But it's been really, you know, especially with the experience of everyday food and Domino, especially with those two experiences, there were very specific briefs walking into that. Um, everyday food was a small digest sized magazine. And Martha was, she had a lot of input and I learned a lot from her in terms of how she would walk up to a wall and, and interpret a page and interpret a recipe. And it was great. I learned so much. And then with Domino, he has incredible vision. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and it's like, you know, if you just try and think about everything that she's managing and has in her empire and then can really just like hone in on something, it's it's a, it's fantastic. And then with Domino, also it had a really cool brief. They had other shopping magazines at, at Condé at the time, which was Lucky and Cargo. And so they wanted to start uh, interiors magazine, shopping based. But the brief was to design this magazine that was like your best girlfriend giving you decorating advice. And it was such like a strong visual brief that you're like, all right, I I know who this girl is. All right, let, let's like figure out the visual for that. So I've been fortunate that they've been really fun sort of briefs from the get go. So it, it is kind of fun to be there at the inception and think about sort of what the personality of that title can become. And then certainly with Gather. How technical do you get in terms of the nitty gritty and the InDesign and the templates and the columns and all that stuff? Are you sketch and hand off or you do it yourself? At the time, especially with Martha, I was very technical. And again, I am so thankful that I got that experience. I learned so much. Gail Towie was hugely influential and really taught me about setting columns and grids and templates and systems before just getting carried away with like, let's get just design, you know, <laughs> as a young kid, you're just like, oh, we have fonts and let's design, let's go crazy. And like, you know, that's when you really sit down and look at magazines, they are built on systems. They have to be built on systems because they have to come out every single month and you can't reinvent the wheel every single month. So to a certain extent, there there should be a system there. <laughs> and, you know, you can't say you can't break that every once in a while. But again, I'm very thankful that I had that training in the beginning. So I was very involved at, at the time with Martha and did a lot of special issues for them and books. And so I was very much part of choosing fonts and building templates and all that sort of stuff. Further into my career now, I'm not. How has it been working in a fairly male-dominated business for all these years? <laughs> Have you felt stereotyped at all to women content? <laughs> a tiny bit, yes. But also at the same time, I have felt that I've had incredible female role models. And I'm so thankful for that. And again, it starts from the very beginning with Chris Weber giving my, me my first internship to Jan Moskowitz, to Martha, to you, Deb, that I'm so thankful that I learned so much from you also. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so it's just, you know, throughout my career, I've had incredible female role models. But yeah, I, I do feel like it, it is hard not to say that a lot of the field is male dominated. And certainly women typically are, you know, working on women's titles but it's very funny we uh had this meeting when we were doing gather and we met this store owner from japan and it was very formal meeting it was very interesting and we were brought into the room and business cards were exchanged and then we all sat down and it's just very big ceremony kind of and then like the first thing he said was like hmm, i thought gather was done by men and i was like not sure how to react to that but i was like i might take that as a compliment I think. was there a certain area of content or a certain kind of magazine that you might have wanted to work on or still might that's not typically female yeah I mean I think maybe like gather is the closest that we've gotten in terms of you know I don't think we made it look like a typical sort of women's title and so I think it, in some ways maybe it's kind of androgynous which interests me so yeah, if anything, you know, it's kind of, we'd like to like keep expanding what Gather is in terms of food and art and storytelling. You can launch a, a grilling magazine for men. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, sure, why not? <laughs> I like that idea. 
I think there is a British magazine grilling. It's called Pit. Have you seen that, Michelle? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we need to go further than that, though. It needs to be makeup for men. <laughs> yeah. Exfoliating. Yeah. That's... <laughs> <laughs> In my research, uh, I, I saw some photos, and I just have to ask, where did you get that big-ass couch in your Condé office? <laughs> it looked like it beat like 10 feet. It was gigantic. Photo tricks, that was not my office. <laughs> that was actually uh, the corner in the art department. So all the designers used to sit next to that big couch. So they had the nice windows, and I was in an office, like, inside. <laughs> so sadly, uh, it made it look quite luxurious, but... Uh, not reality. Don't believe everything you see on the internet. I'm going to guess you didn't get to keep it when you left. <laughs> no, sadly. I would have no room to put it. <laughs> but yeah, that was a good couch. So you just spent a multi-year run at Bon Appetit doing some of the best work out there, the best design work, best photography work in the magazine business for quite a little run. And that ended this past summer. What happened? To be completely honest, it was burnout again. Yet again, I just completely burnt out and I just didn't have any more gas in the tank. And I wish I did because it was a job I really enjoyed. It was a huge, really different type of role, unlike anything I'd done. But I was kind of going back to your question earlier, Deb, I was really proud when I got that position. I felt that all of my years of experience earned me that title. So I was really excited to join the team and ideally bring my experience in food to the title and I, I think I did. You know, it's funny because when I got there, you see this in the magazine industry a lot in terms of waves of staff changing. And I think again, people burn out and then, you know, waves of new teams come. And so when I came in, I was on the tail end of a wave of folks that had been leaving the title again from from what I understand, burnout. So I had to build a brand new design team, a whole new staff, like from scratch. So I built a whole design staff and a photo team. And, you know, within that couple of years, was really proud that we, we turned out some award-winning work. But again, it was ideally really finding some really great, talented people and like letting them really do the best that they do. But, but it took its toll. Yeah. The editor who hired you notoriously had to go in the middle of your run at Bon Appetit, and suddenly you find yourself working with a new editor. What was that like? You know, it was the reality of what happened, and that's... Did the mission stay the same, or did uh, the new editor bring a new perspective on the magazine? Certainly, and I think any person does. So, you know, I think any working relationship with any creative director, with their editor-in-chief, is a new relationship that you work together to achieve a goal. And so it was good. It was, you know, I think I had clear briefs with both editors and didn't disagree with the briefs. And, you know, I, I enjoyed working with both of them. You know, it, it's just the sort of reality of the business that things change and, and you need to be professional yeah. and do your work as professionally as possible. And so it was it was challenging for sure. But again, still really proud of the work we did. You know, unfortunately, at the end, it was just burnout. It was such a big job for somebody who is so creative and, and has been so hands-on in the past. How did you deal with the stress of that? Do you have a favorite swear word? <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, I probably internalized it too much. <laughs> I think most people that know me know that I'm a pretty quiet person. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I, mean, I do. I know that you're quiet. So that's why I'm wondering, <laughs> how did you deal with it? I'm sure very calmly and with grace as always. <laughs> a, a Negroni in the evenings was, you know, a fantastic soother <laughs> for lots of stress. <laughs> um, but I loved the challenges that were really different, you know, in terms of I wasn't just working on a magazine. And it wasn't, that was not my sole focus by any means. You know, I was also part of my team was a branded content team. Part of my team was a fully digital team. And so it was dealing with the scope of print, digital, branding, events. It was massive. And Instagram, you know, Instagram, I, you know, something to talk about the, the future of our business here. You know, how much 
time and focus went to Instagram content. You know, it, it was a lot. And I learned a lot. As challenging as it was, it was it was great. You had a huge team. So what was your strategy for building the team and, and restructuring, recreating a new team? Yeah, I think, as I mentioned before, it's finding those key people that you know that they are so strong that they can lead as well. So I think having a really strong design director who was Chris Cristiano, um, really strong visuals editor who was Michelle Heimerman, and just had incredible staff photographers and branded content art directors. And so, you know, having those key people that helped build that structure, I learned a lot in terms of I can't do everything. I can't be, you know, everywhere all the time. And so I need to trust those people to handle X, Y, and Z for me to review later. And again, I think as long as you're, I think the lack of micromanaging certainly helps give people confidence. And I hope I instilled that, hopefully. <laughs> I probably, they'll probably be like, you micromanage too much. <laughs> when you went to Bon App, did you hire people that you had worked with before? No, everyone was brand new, whole new set of folks, which was great. I, you know, it was, it was a wonderful experience to, and I think also it, it just like goes back to the fact that I'm just, for 10 years before this, I freelanced. That was all I did. I went from place to place. And I actually feel like that really helped me in my career and as a designer. Changing places, changing systems, learning new people really helped me grow. Um, I know it's not the conventional career path. And, you know, some people look at resumes and have red flags and so on and so forth. But, um, you know, Deb, you kind of mentioned just that I am sort of this creative spirit. And I think that taps into my own personality. We'll be right back. Your contributions are the lifeblood of this podcast. Here's how you can support us in this work. Number one, become a sustaining patron by making a monthly donation. Or number two, make a one-time donation in the amount that works best for you. Visit printisdead.co slash support for more information. Um, speaking of food, there was a quote I saw that you said your last supper meal would be a slice of New York pizza. <laughs> from where? 100%. It would be from my local in the West Village here, Village Pizza on 8th Avenue. Everyone, check them out. <laughs> They're wonderful. <laughs> Are you familiar with a Palermo pizza? Yeah, I think so. Actually, I'm not sure. Maybe you should re-explain it to me. Bread crumbs and caramelized onions. Okay. That sounds pretty good. Yeah. I think we're getting hungry. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite slice is, you know, Ben's on, um, I think it's on Spring Street and Thompson. Yes. Ben's Pizza of Soho. That, that would maybe be my very close runner up. <laughs> Love Ben's Pizza. Usually if I've driven to New York, I'll spin by Ben's, just pull right up there and get a Palermo for the road. Highly recommend. Nice. I will check. I, I always get a New York slice when I go in there, but I will get a Palermo next time. I'll check out the recommendation. Well, so you and Bon App broke up. And <laughs> at the time of this interview, we just got the news that several high profile kind of legendary magazines were being shut down by the new company that owns Meredith. How are you feeling about the future of magazines and your future doing them? Yeah, it's um, obviously extremely sad. I hate to see any print title go. And I also know it impacts a lot of people in our industry. So feeling very, very sad about that. But um, yeah, it, that is maybe the million dollar question in terms of where are we going in this industry? And it's a really tough one. I think um, just thinking about how we consume content and just where we are today and where we're possibly going tomorrow, it's obviously extremely digitally based. Um, I know some of those titles are might still be producing digital content, but it is really tough because there's something so different from editorial print design to digital design that I feel like the digital space hasn't captured that yet. And I do feel like some of our, at least some of my thinking, even when I was at BA, was how do we translate our printed editorial experience into digital? And I do think that the New York Times does an incredible job at their digital translations, and it's exciting. And I think that is a path forward to keep an eye on of how you know we i do think somehow we need to keep pushing the digital experience and i know we tried it 
at one point, and I was part of it with uh, Martha, with the iPad experience. And I, I imagine we're going to be revisiting that <laughs> again. But also just how we're how people are accessing it. There needs to be something that's a little more streamlined somehow. So it's a tough question, and I do think. You know, again, I know it was it was mentioned when when Gather was certainly in circulation, the influx of independently printed publications. And, you know, we might be heading towards a place where when we do print, it's specialty high end printing, possibly. And, you know, being a little more tailored in, in when we print and how we print and, you know, maybe the traditional convention of monthly mass market publications is unfortunately like what happened this week. It's not something that the industry is sustaining. Do you think that there would be a way to create Gather Journal, for instance, only digitally? Could you share how you might want to do that in a creative, innovative way? Possibly. Uh, we did do a recipe app for Gather. That was probably the closest translation that we did. The app actually, unfortunately, is no longer available, but we still offer our recipes online. So those are fully accessible with the photographs that we created for it. You know, the biggest part of the creation of Gather are the recipes and the visuals. That's the biggest part of the budget, minus the printing costs. The printing costs actually was the biggest part of the budget. That being said, thinking out loud here, I'm like, oh, wait, actually, maybe we could do it and not spend all of our money on printing unfortunately. But, you know, again, that's the thing. I'm just like, I'm not sure if Gather would be as impactful in a digital space. I would be sad not to see those images printed on the paper that we found and printed on and really researched and worked with the printer on how to replicate the type of imagery that we produced on that kind of paper. There was like this really big love of craft that went into that. And so... That makes me sad, but I'm also like, I don't know if people care. I don't even know if they would notice the difference, but I did. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You said in a folio interview, there's something about holding a magazine. It's very captive in a way. Digitally, I just feel like we're exposed to so much content, which leads me to the next question that's what's sort of the foundational question for this podcast. Where can a great magazine maker take these unique format specific skills? Magazines were the product of editors, designers, photographers, illustrators, writers, all combining their skills to make these beautiful objects and on a schedule. They had a life and an ongoing relationship with their audiences, and there's really just nothing else like them. Where can these skills be applied now? Yeah, I was, again, thinking about that question and, you know, trying to distill it down to its core in terms of what is it that we're all passionate about that we stay in this industry and keep doing? <laughs> and it's not an easy industry to be in. And just sort of thinking about like what we were consuming content wise during the pandemic. But I think at the end of the day, we're all interested in storytelling. And I'm sort of curious how we can keep telling those stories and in what format. And, you know, obviously, I think the streaming services took off during the pandemic and binge watching TV shows, we couldn't consume them fast enough. But, you know, part of me, again, you know, the lover of arts and culture, I'm sort of thrilled by it in terms of the fact that we as a society still love at its essence storytelling and sometimes the storytelling helps us translate what we're processing in the real world which is a lot recently so i'm hopeful that there are still places for us to tell our stories and work with teams of people to tell the stories that being said you know maybe i'm going to go off and make a tv show <laughs> i don't know <laughs> you know, going back to like, do magazines still have a place in all of this? And I think they do. I think they'll just be a little more specialized. And I don't want to say the word thoughtful, but... Yeah, no, I think you're right. I mean, you could look back now and say magazines have been so incredibly underpriced for decades for what you get for the money. Yeah. And back then, you know, yeah. you could get a subscription to Esquire for seven bucks. Yeah. You know, those are the old days mistakes. Among other things, you're currently freelancing at Apple. The other day, we were talking to a creative director who said, quote, for the amount of creative firepower Apple has scooped up from the magazine business, the end result, at least in Apple News, doesn't really show it. What's everybody working on in there? <laughs> 
Well, that's the the tricky thing with Apple is that we are not allowed to talk about it at all. <laughs> so we sign really uh, huge NDAs. <laughs> so I unfortunately can't speak about it at all. Can you talk about what you're working on? Unfortunately, no. But, you know, I do think what I would like to say is that I'm interested in um, this sort of next phase of not being in the editorial world. I've been in the editorial world for so long and, you know, suddenly I'm not on this cycle of I have to produce an issue every month and however many digital content pieces and this and that. And again, I think it sort of goes back to where my career started in a way of having to translate just information into visuals and and I'm very intrigued by it in terms of suddenly being in a different space and format to produce content. I don't know. It's it's an interesting next phase and I know Apple is notorious for scooping up the editorial world and so yeah, I'm very curious by it. I can tell you from my own experience there's nothing like working for yourself. Do you have any plans to begin producing Gather again? And if so, you know, what would that look like as a business? We would love to. And I agree with you. Working for yourself is so thrilling. I mean, again, every single issue of Gather was so rewarding. It was thrilling to get that first box of printed issues and tear it open and look with one eye because we were afraid of typos and mistakes and everything, <laughs> but still very thrilling. We would love to do it. I think we are older and maybe a little wiser now, but I think the uh, for us to be able to do it, I think quite honestly and just frankly, it, we would need some money. I can't imagine you haven't been approached by a publisher. We haven't. <laughs> so anyone who's listening out there, <laughs> we. <we've, laughs> so yeah, uh, no, we never, we never were, but we would, we would love. A silent partner? No, <laughs> I don't know. that that would be the dream, right? But that was also the how we could have full creative control and feel really satisfied by the by the end of the day. But it, like we said, took one hundred percent of blood, sweat, tear, passion, passion, all that sort of stuff. Working nights, weekends, and I don't know if we just have that stamina in us at this point anymore. But you know, creatively, we would love to do it. But I do think the the business model needs to look considerably different. Since leaving Bon Appetit, Michelle has been doing some freelancing, including a current stint working at Apple. For more information, visit michelleoutland.com and follow her on Instagram at Mishi Buttons. Print is Dead, Long Live Print is a production of Modus Operandi Design. For more information, visit our website, printisdead.co, or follow us on Instagram at printisdeadpod. Please give us a rating and review on your favorite podcast app. It really helps. Thanks so much for listening. Consider switching to digital with ReadyMag, the design tool that helps create websites without coding. ReadyMag's WYSIWYG attitude gives you full control over the result. Just drag whatever you want on the page, customize, and hit publish. Or take more time to fine-tune your project with advanced typography, complex animations, integrated analytics, draggable objects, shadows, custom cursors. The possibilities are endless. The first 50 new users to take promo code PRINTISDEAD get a 50% discount to ReadyMag's studio plan. Learn more at ReadyMag.com.